Hey everybody, welcome to tonight's Late Night Happy Hour here on ESPN Los Angeles. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky and I are really having trouble balancing my phone today. Joined in the middle by Harrison Sanford, co-host of Inside the Green Room with Danny Green. Um, a great podcast slash video cast slash just show that you can watch on YouTube. You can watch it on Spectrum Sportsnet. You can just watch it. It's, it's, uh, it's great stuff. Lots of good guests. Um... Who's your who's who's on uh, this week? Uh, we actually just taped something with Javel McGee today, so looking Sweet. forward to putting that out. Uh, we have, we actually spoke with uh, Mark Spears from the mm -hmm. Undefeated as well. Excellent, Mark's yeah. a good dude. Mark's a good dude. Uh, so no, I enjoyed it very much, and we'll probably put it out uh, on Friday because I'll catch up with Danny tomorrow after the Clippers Lakers game. Four, oh yeah, is there a game? Is there a game, like the game, there a game tomorrow? <laughs> Yeah, just a tad bit. Yeah, just now, bit. is is JaVale on the show as a way of saying thank you for Danny taking over his vlog? Like, like is this a little bit of uh, payback, simpatico, that sort of thing? Yes. When when a, when Danny does a favor for a teammate, the ask is very easy. <laughs> yes. So, You're appear uh, on my show. There you go. But JaVale actually popped on the show uh, actually during the quarantine when we were first in the middle of this pandemic, when the, we were the first in this pandemic. And uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen. He actually joined us, and uh, he was spending time at home. So he he double dipped, thankfully. Well, I mean, it, and it, we were just talking about this, and it, so we'll just dive right into it because it is like truly our favorite thing. And I know there's a bit of a a, a bit of a competing thing going on here because um, we love this from Javale. Like we love it. <laughs> oh, hey, didn't see you there. Uh, you can't uh, trim my outdoor hedges, not my indoor hedges. That's what this is for, the Lawnmower 3.0 by Manscaped. It's not only for cleaning your indoor hedges, you also can trim anything else, but that's your business. Go ahead and check out manscaped.com or swipe up on my story to see more. Back to what I was doing. <laughs> it's just, it's just awesome. Like, you know, and, and, you know, and I'll pull up oh, hey. the picture while you guys talk. Oh, didn't see you guys there. Hey, didn't see you there. These people it, who snuck the into best. my backyard. It, it, it's the room. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> like, just, <laughs> it's, so, it's so great. And it's also so JaVale. Like, it is mm -hmm. so perfectly JaVale McGee. Like, not even trying to be convincing of what's going on. Totally in on the joke. But delivers it perfectly. It's, it's it, like Brian said. Neither one of us can get enough of it. Now, you oh, know, boy. I could. I, I am not video <laughs> capable yet of being able. I don't even take the bottom third off so people can get the full view of what's happening here. Like I'm not fully video capable, so um, I couldn't upload Danny's competing Manscaped commercial where he talks about shaving your balls, and those are the balls that he's holding. Uh, to I mean, like Danny really leans into it. Some guys kind of tap dance around it. Some guys are, are not quite willing to uh, to go there. Danny went there, uh, which I think is just awesome with his Manscaped commercial. Oh, you got to go there. I mean, that's the only I mean, the, the product itself. It leans in towards that. I was actually uh, at his house that night when he taped that and I couldn't believe what was happening. Uh, but it, it made for a funny story. We spent about maybe about an hour trying to come up with something for it. We stopped at a sporting goods store. We picked up <laughs> lacrosse balls and we picked up the blue balls. <laughs> like racquetballs, yeah. Balls. Yeah, because we all know what that might symbolize or two. Um, so it was uh, putting it together was fun. And then the whole scene when he's in the bathroom, he's like, just a minute. Uh, <laughs> So it's wait, wait, so wait, so now, yeah, you, you obviously you went tennis balls instead of racket balls, you know, like with the whole blue balls thing. Did like, did you side like that cross the line? Like, where is the line when you're making mm. your manscaped, you know, testicle shaving commercial? Like, where is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there's a line to cross. I mean, it's a product that blatantly discusses shaving your pubic hair. So <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know. We haven't seen it yet. I'm sure once the line is crossed, we'll all know, like, yeah, that wasn't it. Yeah, well, that was that was not tasteful. One, one of the things that I've enjoyed about it, too, is, like, the varying degrees to it, like, and it's been progressive, because there's been, to the best of my knowledge, three Lakers who've done 
manscaping spots. It's Danny, it's JaVale, and it's Alex Caruso. Yeah. Danny was the first. And Danny's just straight up like, yeah, shaving my nuts. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> shaving my balls. That's, That's what, what this is. is. Shaving around that area, shaving the actual area. That's what the, that's what the product is for. It's for shaving your balls if that's your thing. Then JaVale's kind of talking around. He's letting you know, like, you know, there's indoor hedges, there's outdoor hedges. You know, the, the metaphor for, you know, up, down, down there, up here, whatever. But, hey, if that's your thing. Then Caruso's mostly uses the manscaping for more conventional areas. Like the inference being, I'm not a freak like Danny Green (laughs) going around shaving my balls. You know, some of us don't do that, but it's cool. You can use a manscape. (laughs) You can use a manscape for just the traditional, more conventional areas that we all talk about shaving. And, you know, not like a weirdo like Danny. You you know, it caught me off guard when I saw Alex using it under, under his chin. I was like, oh. You could actually, I guess you could use it there. I guess <laughs> but like, but, I guess but, but only if you it. only use it there. Like yes. that, oh, if that's well, yes. sort of you your primary purpose. <laughs> you, you don't want to get into the crisscross in there. It just well, like, doesn't seem. I mean, let's, let's be honest. The, <laughs> Alex's, Alex's spot, we like to put the guest in the middle. There we go. Alex's <laughs> spot is the one that, you know, the white guy does. <laughs> it's like, you know, we're... We're a little nervous. We're a little more buttoned down. We're a little more, you know, nervous about uh, decorum, whatever it might be. <laughs> Alex was just a little more, I don't know. It was From very funny. Under- it's funny. Oh, it was funny. From my understanding, there will be new Manscaped commercials taped in the bubble. Oh. So I'm oh, sure that is breaking have- news. <laughs> I'm sure wow. they'll have uh, some creativity there. I mean, they got time together. There might be a joint ad. Who knows? But uh, that is at least one piece of content I know that bubble will be scaping. coming from the bubble. Yeah, I'm sure. I, wow. When we get into some other topics, I, I could. I, I mean, might be able to tell you something else that's coming. As out. you said, Harrison, everybody has time right now. Like they actually have enough time right now. If they wanted to, they could order liquor from vsliquor.com, which is headquartered out here, and just wait for it to mm-hmm. eventually arrive <laughs> in Orlando because it's deliverable liquor. And the most convenient way to get your alcohol delivered to your door, I guess, unless you're in a bubble in Orlando, in which case it's actually terribly inconvenient. <laughs> but if you're in the LA area, it's the best way to do it. One click on its way. And take notes now, Harrison, if you ch- type sports in the checkout for your first order, that is 15% off. So you can go a little top shelf, uh, okay. maybe, maybe, you save that liquor for when you're celebrating a championship with Danny Green when he gets back, vsliquor.com. Yeah, and if you happen to be manscaping when they drop the liquor off, it's contactless, <laughs> they knock, they leave it there. Um, you know, it's it's cool. Like, you know, it's easy to do. So you don't have to stop <laughs> no, really, whatever you it is. Time what... it better, honestly. <laughs> like, that's I, sort of on you. That, you, don't, you don't want to get interrupted while you're, while you're manscaping. Exactly. So. And, and more importantly, you don't want to answer the door. And neither no, does the guy from the, the VS Liquor guy doesn't want that either. Like, you know, I, I don't mean to he'll sound do his metal. job, you do your job, and everyone meets at the end. It's I fine. don't mean to sound judgmental, but like, what freak show says, you know what, I just ordered my top shelf tequila time to do a little manscaping? Yeah. No, 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 I don't think it's that. I think it's, I just ordered my top shelf tequila. Oh, bleep, I forgot to do my manscaping. I think that's more how it works. Oh, wait, so, so have you guys... By the way, they're uh, not a sponsor of this show. This has been like 10 minutes. Okay. No, we're just blatantly <laughs> pandering to try to get them. Absolutely there you go. free I, advertising for that. the folks over at Manscaped. Not against that. Have we ever what? I was going to ask if you've ever... Uh, I have not. Dabbled I have not. I'm Manscaped. not above it. I just never have. Okay. No, Andy. Wait, the, the question is whether or not you're below it, not above it. See what I did there? <laughs> I'm holding out to get paid to do it, Harrison. I feel like if I do this a little fair. longer, we play JaVale's ads a little longer, eventually they will pay me to manscape. I have a theory. Um, yeah, I, I, I that there are certain things in here, like I am never, I don't think, going to do Coke. And I don't judge people who like, try to experiment this or that because there's a certain point in your life where like you can do those things. It's like, I'm in my 20s. I'm going to Vegas with the boys. I, I'm going to give that a try. I don't recommend it. I'm not saying you should, but like people do that. Mm -hmm. I'm in my 40s. 
I've never done cocaine. I'm not going to do it. Then your window, Nobody, your window just passed. Right. It, it sucks. I mean, it, maybe it sucks. Maybe it's an experience that I'll never have, but my cocaine window has closed. Um, <laughs> I, I can't open it. And it's just, it's one of those things that I'm not going to be able to do. I'm married. I have three children. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be doing a lot of manscaping at this point. Again, maybe it's an experience, but it's possible my manscaping window is closed. Only time will tell. <laughs> it's true. You're right. You, There's no way to know. If you if you just so happen to end up with some product, you know, I would I would say you might as well see what it does for you. If you I, end up with product, it's a quarantine. If you end up with it's product, a quarantine. <laughs> it <laughs> might <laughs> it might end up the thing that saves the relationship. You never know. Like it might. Hey, I wasn't going to be the one. <laughs> Things are solid. I'm not right now. We're doing fine. Uh, but I, it, long quarantine, man. It is. It is. And people living with me this long can't be easy for anyone. Um, so look, I want to you. One of the things, and I actually asked Danny a question about this. And we've talked to Javale about it. How did you get uh, hooked into this? Because the the phenomenon, not just of athletes using their vo- uh, podcast, but just athlete created content the guys building this stuff out and kind of bypassing espn bypassing fox bypassing these traditional um it, it has exploded over the last few years so how did you get hooked into it uh well my relationship with danny goes back to high school uh, i kind of knew that i wasn't going to be a professional basketball player very early uh, so i started traveling around long island where we're both from in new york city writing articles about high school players in Long Island, Queens, Brooklyn, um, and all the places around the New York City metro area, and Danny obviously being one of the better players. Uh, we began to friendship from there. Then I knew he wanted to get into broadcasting. I had some broadcasting experience in a couple different markets in America. I mean, it's, I've been in Ohio, and I've been in Georgia, and stopped in Houston. So when I had the opportunity with some more time on my shoulders, I just approached him and uh, Ask him if he wants to do it, but that's actually something I've been doing. Um, true, like basketball heads would know about five five star basketball camp. Um, and so when I was working with five star, they had um, evolved into a bas- high school basketball coverage website. So at that time, I was doing video blogs with uh, some of the top high school players in the country at the time. I don't know if you guys remember Isaiah Austin, who ended up at Baylor. I know the Marfin name. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. Him, uh, Nate Britt, who also went to North Carolina as well. Uh, there's a couple other guys who were, and Shabazz Muhammad. I'm sure you guys oh, remember sure. Shabazz Muhammad. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, I, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I would work with Shabazz and a couple other guys, and we would do a video, they would do a little video blog, and I'd edit it for them. And that was a part of what I kind of started doing when I got out of college. So I kind of been always in this athlete centric media path. Uh, for a while now and obviously just knowing Danny for a while and having time in my schedule and him getting to the end or nearing the end of his career it's time for him to get some reps it made perfect sense you're calling him old basically is what you're saying now that well, he's, an old, he's an old person well I'm I'm what I'm, I'm like three four months older than him no five four months older than him so he's yeah, like half he's dead <laughs> according to you <laughs> in basketball terms and then Danny's the first to admit that he doesn't feel the same that he used to. So yeah, he's getting he's getting there, but he's got some more years. Frankly, he's approaching his manscaping window. There I mean, you the, go. the age that he's getting up to. What what was he like in high school? Uh, pretty much the same that he is now. He's the oldest of three brothers. Constantly shaving brothers his now. pubic hair. Well, he's yeah. always doing that. <laughs> 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 from an early age uh no he was uh always the responsible one you know if if there was a high school party that guys were going to he was the guy who was driving everybody home mm-hmm. um he was always about the work uh he was very consistent in just showing uh, appreciation for people around him uh i was always surprised that when i first started to like get to know him that he would actually acknowledge me and i think you guys and we us being in the media you guys can tell that he always uh, appreciates everybody and tries to give them his time when he can. And so he's always been that way, and it still shocks me uh, to this day because I know he's not a superstar, but he's made a career and he's made a name but for see, himself and that's, playing basketball. That's one of the things that I think is, is really interesting about this trend is, you know, you look at some of the really prominent podcasts. You know, we got the 
you know, retired guys with like, the, you know, the knuckleheads with, at Players Tribune and J.J. Redick, who's, you know, had a great career, but he's not a Hall of Famer. And Danny's got a podcast and, you know, JaVale is like blowing up. Matt, uh, Matt Barnes content. is among the most prominent members of the NBA media right now. Mm-hmm. He was a journeyman. Like he was a straight up journey. He played for every California NBA team once and all but the Lakers twice. You know, I mean, he moved everywhere. And, you know, Matt Barnes has become as prominent as anybody. Yeah. And so, like, it's not just like LeBron. Like, I get why LeBron has a, you know, doesn't, he has a platform and can do whatever. It's, it's that it's everyone. It's like everybody who's got it. And, and, you know, somebody like Danny, who, you know, who's really thoughtful and, um, you know, he's got a great sense of humor, really dry and all that. I mean, then like JaVale, who's just a completely unique player. And you go down the line. Like, there's an audience for guys to really learn about these people as people that just, I mean, flat was not there when, you know, what, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Danny broke into the league. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think for, for Danny and I, a lot of guys around the league, I think they, they understand that they need to have a certain work ethic with it. So the guys who are prominent now in the podcast and game, the JJ Reddicks of the world, uh, they take it seriously. So oh, yeah. I never feel when I tell Danny, hey, we need to put out an episode leading up to this game or we need to put out an episode because we haven't put out in a, one in a while. I never feel like I'm putting a burden on him because I think he understands the importance of one reps, but the importance of continuing to be present and continuing to respect the field of journalism. And where I feel as sometimes when you're a really, really good player, you just feel like you could say anything. And <laughs> It doesn't matter. It's going to cause wavelengths. Uh, but a guy like Danny, maybe a guy like J.J. Redick, uh, maybe not so much as C.J. McCollum. He's probably in a different caliber of player. But I think those guys take a, a more serious approach to journalism. Well, C.J. takes I've it been, really seriously. Yeah, you, I, they, he really does. And I, because I've been approached by some other guys who said, hey, I see what you're doing with Danny. Can you help me? And I'm like, sure, I'll help you. And then the interest fades real quick because they realize you actually have to work at it. You actually have to put some time in your schedule. You have to do the uncomfortable thing of asking other guys to come on the show, which is probably the thing that players hate the most. How, I was just saying, it's uncomfortable asking guys to come on. How uncomfortable is it to ask them hard questions, though, too? And like, how much, how much do you have to encourage athletes when you, when you talk to them and work with them about these things? Like, no, you got to, you have to be legit about it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. continuing to be something that Danny and I continue to work on. Usually, I like to ask the hard questions, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, that usually works out well that way. Danny sometimes he'll ask the hard questions, but I think, and, and I think Danny has learned, as long as you have a relationship with the person, and as long as you address what you're going to talk about before beforehand, then any question is pretty much fair game, as long as it's not you know too outlandish. And I think players in general they're going to continue to evolve and and appreciate that level of question and, and guys being taken that side of it more seriously. But it is an evolving challenge. When I was speaking to JaVel in, in the episode that we'll put out shortly, he was discussing with us how it is for him to hear other former players criticize him uh, as analysts and how it, it impacts him or how it could impact him. And so he has a perspective. Like I, I said to him, well, who do you want Danny to be when Danny goes into – becomes an analyst. Like, if you have a bad game, it's Danny's job to say, oh, you had a bad game. And so everybody's kind of trying to find the balance of this now because players are now doing it while they're active as I, opposed I, to being former. I, I think, and I mean, obviously, it's not an apples-to-apples apples comparison because, you know, I, I I talk about players and, you know, my opinion of, you know, how they played, whatever, but, you know, I'm, I'm they, not their We're peer. also fairly sure they don't care what we think. <laughs> well, but, I mean, they... They don't care. I think they do care, but they don't care. In They might care about something we say, but I think it's different in terms of caring about what one of their peers may Correct. say. Correct. Absolutely. I was, you know, yeah, totally. And, you know, I mean, they, they, I've, I've heard from players, you know, it doesn't happen often, but, you know, if nothing else, I've had players want them to, uh, want me to send them something that I've written before, like a profile that I'm doing about them, like, you know, that I know that they read it, that sort of thing. But I remember we uh, we had Byron Scott on the show, like, I don't know, maybe a month ago. And, you know, when, when Byron was coaching the Lakers, Brian and I were pretty candid that, 
we didn't think his approach with the young players worked. And for like the setup that he had for this team, we didn't think really was was the right approach for a team that young built that way that also, in theory at least, he was looking to build that relationship to coach that young core for a while. And, you know, we were critical of it. And, you know, Byron knew this stuff, A, because you know these guys hear everything, but B, you know, he knew the questions that we'd ask him, you know, before and after games and things like that. But our relationship with Byron was always really good. We always liked him a lot personally. And, you know, since then, you know, clearly it didn't bother him. He was on our show. But I think it's if you're not taking cheap shots, like in being critical, I think players and other people can respect it, even if they don't like it. If they can tell you're not coming at a place where you're just looking to take shots, you know, really to build up your own name at their expense, then I think they don't mind it. They may not like it, but they don't like it. They get it. They don't resent it. Mm-hmm. I mean, these are guys who get criticized from coaches left and right all day long, uh, their entire career. So mm-hmm. I don't think they're above taking criticism, but I do think you, you do bring up a good point there. Sometimes uh, it comes more demeaning, uh, but sometimes it makes for good entertainment. <laughs> so it's, it's hard. Well, it's, it's hard. Sometimes what's, someone's got to take the bullet. Well, I mean, what's funny about it, too, and this is something Brian and I've talked about a lot on air, like there is, though, there'd be times where, you know, I, you know, thought Byron did something wrong or or Luke or Phil Jackson or like a player, you know, I, I'm like, I don't know what they were thinking out there or whatever. There is sometimes a point of absurdity where I'm like, I am criticizing the basketball decisions or basketball acting right. of Byron Scott, three-time NBA champion. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So Harrison, like, you understand. Andy can't dribble. And I'm like, I, I'm barely <laughs> exaggerating when I say that Andy can't dribble. I mean, not my te- strong suit. technically he can, but it's like <laughs> watching a grizzly bear try to do it. There's just this like. I don't like have this, gr- I don't have great hands. I do not have great. I'm not a terrible athlete, but I have. Because pretty and, uh, as, as our, our we, we have the same football coach would have said uh, hands like feet. Um, yes. he's, he's got, he's got, like, hey, you there's been a couple of times down. where I've been like, I've been on a panel with like an NBA player and he'll say something and I'm disagreeing and in my head. I'm like, Wait, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> how can you possibly tell him he's wrong? But you know, what's funny It's like, you know, Harrison, I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, and I see no, this fine. a little bit in your, in your, in your interview with, with JR that was up last week, the, from last week. Sometimes guys, and I, you know, I see that dynamic that you were talking about where sometimes maybe you ask the questions a little bit tougher, especially now that they're teammates. But like, sometimes guys, and I've heard it with J.J. Reddick's podcast and I hear it on the Knuckleheads, they forget that because they're so comfortable talking to another athlete, a guy who gets it. Sometimes I think they forget that they're talking in a thing that we all get to hear it eventually. Um, so there's a level of comfort there. I mean... It, have you noticed that sort of thing with, with that dynamic where some of I wonder if you almost get more. Yeah, no, I think there are definitely instances where you do get more because of that comfort level. And that's mm-hmm. something that the, it, somebody you can't replicate unless you're on the court with the guys, unless you've gone out to multiple dinners or you, you saw them, you know, have a personal moment in the locker room. It's just something that we can't replicate and they know they speak the language. Right. Uh, so it's just something that, I, I believe. Yeah. Go. go I go. believe. You know, I believe these player podcasts are so great for the fans. Mm-hmm. And like for example, last year when we were in Toronto, Danny and I were doing the uh, the podcast, and Serge Ibaka uh, was doing this. Uh, How hungry are you? Where you have the teammates in there eat ridiculous things like cow mm-hmm. testicles, but in the midst of eating cow testicles, you'd learn about a guy's background and things of that nature. And because these guys are open with each other, <laughs> because these guys are open with each other, I think fans, all of a sudden, they're not just rooting for number 43. They're rooting for the guy who what, struggled through a single family home, who loved this subject in school and was went in the first round of the draft and didn't know if he'd make it. And then they're rooting for this guy who came from the middle of America and didn't think he was even going to make it mm-hmm. get the D1 scholarship. And because of these podcasts and having these players open up, I just, I'm so envious as a fan. Cause I used to be a fan of a, a, a team in New York uh, that was, 
in my childhood, and then it, I kind of cut them off as soon as they made the Porzingis trade. Uh, but <laughs> it took I, you that long. Uh, you held yeah, out I, that long. I, I, I like I like to say I'm loyal, but loyalty has has <laughs> has a ceiling. Uh, but no, I wish when I was a really you'll never get that time back, Harrison. No, I know, I know, I'm aware. Uh, <laughs> but if I was a young exuberant fan of a team, the idea that I could learn about these guys and not just what's fed to me through the team's social media channel, but I could get it from the the actual players themselves uh, as a fan. They're getting so much more now to really start to not just appreciate the brand, but appreciate the players who are representing the brand. And I think that's a a welcome addition now to this media circle. It's like if you haven't had a chance to, you know, what people can watch out for the for the episode with JaVale, which I'm sure will be awesome. But JR's episode is really he's really candid. And so if you're a guy who likes JR, I think you'll you'll come out of it. If you're somebody who has you know isn't a big fan or whatever, you might find some stuff in there that you know. Oh, that's why I don't like it. But I do think what you're saying though, like you learn about the guy, like you get a perspective of where he comes from. So if you choose to still not like him as a player, and you really shouldn't dislike these guys as human beings. I mean, we don't. None of us know. I mean, come on. But you, at least you, you, you're coming from from a, a more educated place. You you mentioned. Uh, that you used to be in Ohio. Really quick, be- oh, really, sorry, really quick ahead, uh, before we go to Ohio. That maybe the most interesting detail in, in the interview with JR, I mean, I, two things. First of all, that he, you asked him about uh, him and uh, Dion Waiters, you know, and they both mm-hmm. are uh, clutch clients. And, you know, like if, if there had been any type of, you know, not animosity, but they were both trying out for one spot that Dion Waiters got uh, right before the season was suspended. And then, you know, eventually Jr. ended up getting a spot when uh, Avery opted out, and you know Jr. said no, and you know he was happy for Dion. They they had they didn't really know each other before that, but in talking about perceptions of both of them, I, I thought it was very mature of Jr. to say, "Look, I've had certain baggage that I brought on myself. Like I've had issues off the court that if people are going to judge me on, you know, they can or they can't. But either way, like that's at least something that happened." As opposed to, I, I think the way he was putting it, with with Dion, there really wasn't much there. The other thing, though, that I thought I, this blew my mind: Jr. to stay in shape bought a bicycle that cost eleven thousand dollars. I I didn't know an eleven thousand dollar bike existed. <laughs> oh, you could spend yeah. more than that if you want. I, I had Bikes no are idea. Expensive. I mean, eleven grand. You can buy. You can buy a. I don't know, a cheap used car for $11,000. I don't know what exactly an $11,000 bike gets you versus a $1,000 bike. You must have plush seats. Well, I don't know. (laughs) Lots of gears. I I bet you get lots of gears. Many, many gears. Like 20, 25, 30. How many do you want for 11 grand? Uh, Yeah, right. No, it's, uh, no, I, I, uh, I think that the, the level that he's come back in in terms of being in shape, it has to be impressive to anybody. Obviously, nobody's going to be in playing game shape, but uh, for him to show that dedication, to be to come to L.A. and leave his family so that he could just work out here for that amount of time and to go through uh, you know moments of depression um, really shows his dedication. I actually spoke to his high school uh, AU coach before I spoke to him, and I think everybody was taken aback that he that he even uh, admitted that he's going through depression or admitted that he had was struggling with this because Jr. is somebody who's always loved to play basketball. But I think the humbling nature of what happened to him um, really it hits you in the face, and you don't realize what you miss until it's gone. And uh, now he has an opportunity to play with LeBron again for the world's greatest basketball brand in the historic season with a legitimate chance to win a title. And you, <laughs> thankfully, he's ready for it. I mean, great for him that he was prepared for this moment because yeah. let's say he wasn't, that's it. You know, th- nobody oh, knows yeah, that, that, that Avery yeah, Bradley's not right. going to come. Same so thing with Dwight. That, that's what I think was, is, was, was interesting about Dwight this year is like this was last chance saloon. Like if, he, if it doesn't work here, he is not going to be picked up again. I mean, Around let's be honest. If DeMarcus Cousins doesn't get yeah. hurt, I'm not 100% sure Dwight's in the league. 
I don't know if another team was going to give him a chance the way the Lakers did, and he wasn't their first option. And to Dwight's credit, though, he's made the most of that opportunity. Yeah, I think that that has to bode well for them in this bubble because you know Dwight has has already talked about uh, wanting to stay in Atlanta because of all the things that he has to go through in terms of social in social justice issues with his family in Atlanta, and so for him to go back to go into this bubble after being out of the league after overcoming all of these demons that he's had with the fan base uh, from his previous stint here. Uh, it's pretty pretty impressive for him to be locked in and loaded and being in the shape that he's in, coming off of all of these years where he's been mu- uh, m- misconstrued or maybe taken the right way with uh, how his locker room antics, how some of them seem, how some people see it to have been uh, in his previous thoughts. All right. I, now, I was about ready to change the subject, but now I, because I'm really, really proud of myself for how quickly I can do this now, I want to play a game with everyone. <laughs> I want to play sure. a game of how expensive is this bicycle? <laughs> All right. So I'm okay. going to show you a picture of a bicycle, and I want you to tell me how expensive is this bicycle. Ooh, some okay, shiny that's, handles. That's the, uh, that's the road bike, right, because of the handles? It's a road bike, correct. It's a road bike. So we're looking it is at the, it. Is a, it's, a, it's a road bike by a company called Aurumania. I'm going to go with... I'm gonna go with six fifty. Six hundred fifty dollars. Yeah, six hundred fifty dollars. Um, one question. Yes. What is a road bike? A bike you ride on the road. Like okay, so, 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 bike. so the, the bike, okay. the, the tires are a bit thinner. Yes. My understanding, uh, so you could be on pavement uh, a bit easier. And then I, the one thing that you could notice about it right away from the pictures, I think, is the handles. The way the handles are curled. Yes. Under. Like and in, it's kind of bent way, down, so like you're meant to ride this thing. So you fast. could. Yeah, so you could hunch over. So you could hunch over. Okay, I, I'm very impressed by the handlebars. They they look expensive in and of itself. <laughs> very impressed <laughs> so by the handlebars. I'm going to say thirteen hundred. This bike is one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. Uh, <laughs> it's one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. It is gold. It is uh, plated with twenty four oh, karat gold. Wow. Six hundred individual crystals by Swarovski. It also has a Brooks brand leather saddle and handlebar grips made from brown leather. Um, and so J.R. Smith only spending eleven thousand uh, dollars actually seems quite restrained. Next bicycle. Do you, actually, do you, you know what? Buy that bike. Or does that, is that in your like, driveway like it's like a fancy car? <laughs> Here's the thing. Do whatever you want with it. It's my fault that I got that one so wrong because my initial reaction was, oh, my God, that looks really expensive. But then Harrison went 650 yeah, after I being – Right, but it, but it's you were able to properly identify that as a road bike. So I'm like, well, he must know what he's talking about. Right. All right, how much is yeah, this I bicycle? Yeah, I messed up the price. <laughs> the price of it. Uh – this is a Trek Yoshimoto, Yoshimoto Nara. A Trek Yoshimoto Nara. I'm How much to, is this bicycle? I'm going to go with 15000 Just Andy? because I know we're talking big numbers now. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, those tires look fake. Um, they it they was don't one, look it was a, stable. a model previously ridden by Lance Armstrong. Okay. Hence the lives on yeah. fiber. Yeah. I'm gonna say fiber. that I'm gonna say that that bike is ninety seven thousand dollars. This bike is two hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Those tires don't even look functional. Dollars. Uh, finally, My as we God. wrap up everybody's favorite game show, how much is that bicycle? <laughs> how much is this bicycle? Okay, so you gotta have one cheap one in, in this in this thing, right? Am I? What's going on here with this bike? I'll tell. You, hold on, before you, you should know. This is a Trek Butterfly Madone or Madone. I apologize if I. I actually know uh, the answer to this because I, okay. I think I know where you're getting this from. Yeah, but Harrison, go first because I want to know your answer. At the, at this point, I'm gonna just go a hundred thousand dollars. At this point, All right, just, is it, is, okay, it, Andy. That's a five hundred thousand dollars. This is bike. a five hundred thousand dollar bicycle. What? Uh, designed <laughs> by our, uh, our artist Damien Hurst and bought at an auction. Um, it apparently uses real butterfly wings, which is awful. 
The bike utilized what? real natural wings from butterflies. That's terrible. What? <laughs> you didn't buy that bike, wow. Peter. That's horrible, right? No, but, that's, but anyway, that's a half a million dollar bicycle. So Andy's like shock that J.R. Smith spent eleven thousand dollars on his bicycle is like totally misplaced. Well, I, I actually found the article that that clearly that you it's uh, yes, I, believe I was working very, you have to admit, um, that was pretty good. Yes, it for, was. It for was working it, quickly. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this article in the Periscope right now, but it's uh, coastandbikes.com backslash most expensive bicycles. Yeah, um, there are some crazy there are some crazy bikes in this thing. Yeah, uh, but anyway, that was uh, I don't know about that you was guys, but I'm very comfortable with. It. That was um, very that was a great show. Three I uh, three hundred. Yeah, look, I'm at you, comfortable. look at you, first world big spender, <laughs> <laughs> David Velasen. David Velas in the uh, Periscope asked, who made that bike, Buffalo Bill? <laughs> I bought my bike from the guy at the end of the block. Uh, it has like this store that's just filled with bikes that you probably don't want to ask really in detail, like where they come from. Um, $75. It's from like 1996. Rock solid. There you go. So you Monty, do it, man. Monty underscore 10. I've always wanted to get a reverse mortgage to buy one of those bikes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is, so again, J.R. Smith, only five, only $11,000. That actually is quite modest when you think about it. You know who actually might buy one of those bikes is LeBron. LeBron loves to ride that bike. Remember, he used to ride back and forth uh, from wherever he lived in Cleveland to the queue. You can use some of that manscaping money for well, that. I think him. I think there was a viral clip uh, right before. Uh, I think this is right before the, the protests and, and, and the social justice protests started happening. I think there was a clip of Jr. Anthony Davis and LeBron biking down. I think that was Sunset Boulevard on a Saturday morning one day. Um, I know Sunset so, had some of those protests. Yeah, I think it was. I, I, it wasn't related to the protest, but I think it was like the week. It was like the time frame right before. The, 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 okay. Everything's a little bit hazy once the whole protest thing happened for a while. Obviously, it's still going on now, but that was just a whole different. Well, I mean, also, frame. I mean, it, I was going to say it feels like everything that happened, you know, once the world stopped, it feels like every day is both a blur and a crawl. Like it, it feels like this is all like six years ago, yet the days are going by quickly at the same time in a weird way because they all just sort of blend together mm -hmm. into one big day. I can't believe we're in August. We're pretty much in August. Yeah. Well, you know, my wife and I were talking about this today. Like, March took six years. April took about eight years. May, about the same. June and July have flown by. Yep. Like, really yep. quick. Yeah, I, I don't... I feel the same way. It's been... Uh, Things have picked up a little bit here. I, obviously, because more people are outside and doing things, but uh, it, it's still when you. I'm sure when we look back at it, we're going to be like, "What was that? <laughs> what that that whole time period? Uh, it, we lived. We're in a history book right now, for sure." Well, I'm, I'm yeah, ready for the next I, chapter. I don't, I don't yeah, need to be. Sure. I'm, I'm done. I'm done with that. Um, all right. So we, we we were about to get before we were sidetracked for what was totally worth it with that whole bike thing. <laughs> um, you you were actually around and with LeBron and covered you know in, in in Ohio like you've seen now like both stages of this with his career. What's different? You know because you know obviously the talent's still there, but what's different? Hmm, do you want to talk about gameplay or do you want to talk about whatever? You you tell me. Okay, uh, I would say, and, and I think a lot of people going into the season anticipated that there would be some sense of drama. Uh, I think LeBron and, and Rob Palenka had talked about LeBron's influence on the roster making, and I can't say this for sure, but if you look at the roster that LeBron is playing with now, so a lot of there's a lot of mature guys who are playing roles mm -hmm. on this team, and uh, you have the Danny Greens of the world, you have the JaVale McGee who's won two titles, uh, and then you have a bunch of guys on clutch who I'm sure LeBron has a relationship already. You have Dwight Howard here. Um, and so I think that has played a factor. And if you guys remember back in Cleveland, there was a lot of 
drama coming out of Cleveland. I remember LeBron had that phase where he was making passive aggressive comments yeah. about certain players on the team. Um, and it never, it felt unsettling, even though they were going to the finals all the time uh, for four straight years. Uh, I think the fact that the team here consistently boasts about chemistry, which is something that I don't think I've ever really heard a team be so boisterous about. And you say it in passing, but almost every interview from the from LeBron down to the last man on the bench, they always talk about the chemistry. And I think that's a And it's not uh, BS. Credit that's to the thing. It's not yes, BS. No, it's it's, it's, it's but, actually true. Yeah, I mean, this is something Brian and I have talked about, written about a lot, you know, over the course of the season, about how this team from the jump has been really connected in a way that either they are exceptional actors or this is not fake. And this is something that, you know, is palpable from our perspective. But from someone who knows Danny well, and, you know, I'm sure hears a lot about this team, why do you think this has happened? Like, you know, what do you think has brought on this type of chemistry? Hmm. Uh, I think the trip that they took to Vegas before the year started, I think the China experience, and mm-hmm. I think LeBron is playing a, a, a big role in gathering guys. I think LeBron probably treasures being with this team. If you remember how he left Cleveland that last year, remember Kyrie left, Kyrie won it out. And so I think LeBron appreciates the ability to be with a team, a competitive team that could win him a title, but that also guys around the same age there's a number of guys there who are around the same age. If they're not the same age, they're, they're all pretty much tied to clutch. So I think from that standpoint, LeBron is, Danny says LeBron is always jovial and it makes a lot of jokes in, in the group chat. And let's face it, LeBron, as great as he is, he he's probably recognized he doesn't have too long. So why not enjoy the process? And if you could enjoy it on the way to winning the title, even better. Uh, so I think LeBron, it, it, it's another... We always knew LeBron was mature, uh, but I think he's shown another love of maturity now, mm-hmm. being in the spotlight with the Lakers and, and embracing his teammates um, more than he has than maybe the last year or two in Cleveland when things were a bit Well, I mean, rocky. it was definitely more than last year. I mean, I, I yeah. can say this as somebody who covered that team. LeBron was very outwardly disconnected. You know, and from, from the moment he got here, he seemed yeah. that way. I think it was easy... It's easy for somebody to say, and kind of, I mean, like, LeBron is is a smart guy. I mean, obviously. Really smart. Really smart guy. And understood intellectually what last year needed to be and how it was going to be hard. And, like, you know, look, we're not going to win a title. We're not going to, you know, it's, it's, it's progress. It's step A on the way to B, C, D, E, and so on. And I think he's like, okay, I, you know, I can do this. But then doing it is a lot harder. And the frustration, I think, that comes in. And we saw this with Kobe. It was even when Kobe knew that he was with the team, he had to be patient. And it was like, you, it's going to take a minute. When you're that competitive, when you're a guy who goes to the finals every flipping year for like a decade almost, saying it and then adjusting to the reality of it are different. And you could see like... They kind of, you know, the joy was starting to kind of be there around Christmas, even if he, still in the back of everybody's mind, it was like, okay, maybe not finals, but you know what? This is a fun team. We could do some stuff. And then obviously the injury and it all goes down from there. And it just, it, it, it's hard. Like it, people underestimate how hard it is to be that competitive and that driven. You know, and an interesting thing, if you look at the way that LeBron is playing, versus how he had to play in Cleveland, versus how he had to play in Miami. He is relying on his teammates to uh, enhance what he's bringing on the court in terms of playmaking. LeBron's playmaking responsibilities have never been this uh, this heavy mm. in his career. No, he, had, he had Dwayne Wade in Miami. He had Kyrie Irving in Cleveland. Here in L.A. right now with this specific team, he has to create so much. And so well, it would behoove him not to ingratiate himself with his teammates because they have to catch, they have to make those threes, they have to run the court so he can do those pitch aheads and all other types of play sets that they're running that require LeBron to be the great playmaker that he is. 
Yeah, I mean, this team is, I mean, frankly, at times, scarily dependent on LeBron, like offensively, in terms of that offense functioning. Like, we've seen periods, a lot of periods throughout this season where when LeBron steps off the court, even if it's for a few minutes and, you know, 90 seconds, things can fall apart in a hurry because they're, it's really designed for LeBron to run it. Like, like specifically, LeBron do it. So when you have a guy like Anthony Davis as the focal point, as great as, you know, AD is. AD is, you know, top five player th- this year. He's going to be first team all NBA. And he can make plays, but he doesn't make plays in the exact same orchestrating from anywhere on the floor that type of control over a game like LeBron. And, you know, and, and Rajon Rondo is like a traditional playmaker, but he's he's – Frankly, well past the point of you know where he can right, none dictate of those guys a game. Can put, none of those guys can put up thirty while they can run a floor like right. Magic Johnson. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, like you know, Le- what LeBron's doing is pretty unprecedented. Like in terms of putting up this type of production this far into your career. Like if you look at where LeBron is on the all-time minutes, it's insane. Like what's still being asked of him, what he's still delivering. So to to your point, Harrison. It, he needs these guys to feel connected. Like he needs these guys to all be on that same page. And you know, the the deeper you can make that page feel that you're all on, you know, in so many different facets, the better it's going to be. I think on the court, and also too, I th- I think he genuinely likes this group. And this group, for whatever reason, the personalities really all click because it happened really fast. Yeah, no, it was surprising. I- I know it's interesting because Danny has spent so much time in San, San Antonio and then he had a great experience in Toronto and he flat out says best team chemistry I've ever seen. We go out together, do everything together. And I'm, Danny, you, you played in San Antonio and you're pretty successful there. You, you won pretty much all the time and you had teammates from all over the world. He's like, no, that was great. And then Toronto, what about that? It's fun, new experience. Great city, you won a title. He said, "No, I loved it." But the chemistry uh, here uh, for this team has been uh, unparalleled. I mean, I think another thing, and and this is unfortunate that Demarcus is not with the team. But obviously, Demarcus Cousins, Rondo, and uh, Anthony Davis, they had the level of chemistry that they had yeah. together in New Orleans. So I'm sure they brought that over. I mean, there's so much. There was that. There's that carryover. There's Danny and LeBron having played together before in 2010. And I know, obviously, Danny was talking to LeBron as free agency was kind of figuring itself out. So you have that factor. I mean, there's a lot of things that played into it, but it still came together. I I was just about to say, Danny in particular being on this team is, it's a fascinating little wrinkle just in the sense that the Lakers lucked out in the sense that Danny specifically played for Toronto. And he specifically was waiting on Kawhi's decision, like openly waiting for it. He saying, I, I, you know, he wasn't making any secret about this. If Danny had not played, if Danny had not played specifically for Toronto, if he had yeah. not been, you know, if he hadn't been on any other team, the Lakers likely wouldn't have gotten him because the Lakers were waiting for Kawhi. And, you know, understandably, Kawhi is top five player in the league. You know, if you have the opportunity to team him up with LeBron and AD, you do it. But if, Danny had not been specific on Toronto. There's no way he would have waited that long. I mean, I know Dallas for I mean, Danny, Danny's been open that Dallas was no, interested. Him up. Yeah. Right. No, I, so, I, yeah, I just that, was that, that little. Dan- Go ahead. I was just going to say that, that that little wrinkle, that little twist of fade brought Danny here. And it's specifically just this offseason. Yeah, no, it's it's a it was a unique circumstance. Uh, I thought there was multiple times Danny was going to pull the trigger for Dallas because going into, you know, after winning the championship, the last thing you want to do is wait around uh, and not have any assurances what's going to happen. Uh, but no, it's, it, it, was, it is a good twist of fate. And there's so much, there's a lot of carryover when you think about who's on the Clippers and who's on the, who's on the Lakers. I mean, you have Coach Lou who's mm-hmm. still oh, yeah. uh, on, on, uh, coaching for the Clippers on the bench. So that's going to be interesting with him knowing LeBron. But then you got Phil Handy who also came from Toronto as well after coaching Kawhi last year and spending extensive time with him and helping him with his handle and how he works with his dribble. Now he's back with LeBron in L.A. So there's so it's a lot of carryover from Toronto to now this L.A. matchup, which 
obviously we all hope we get at some point during the playoffs. You you get the you <laughs> you have a view of of Toronto, not to you know jump a, a, across conferences, but you have a view of Toronto and understanding that a lot of people don't. How dangerous are they? Uh, you know, without Kawhi, uh, they are really really good. So last year, I think well, I think just because they're not in. America, we don't talk about them a lot, and I really wish basketball fans would, mm-hmm. just because they are really that good. I think that <laughs> as they, Americans, we don't really pay attention to other countries. Period, Harrison. Yeah, like they're, they're, yeah. they're not our business. It's unfortunate because they could play some pretty damn good basketball. But the yes, they of, can. The thing that's impressive about them, and, and it still reigns true now, and last year was evident as well. At all times, they could put five players on the floor that could all hit threes. And none of those players on the floor you want to attack defensively. There's no now. Not, we're not saying that uh, Pascal Siakam is Anthony Davis, but you're not going to attack no. Pascal Siakam. He's not a weak he's spot. Hit sure. There you go. So you just so they just have at all times they could put five players on the floor that can hit threes and play defense. And then the thing that I like about them the most uh, is head, is Nick Nurse, who's my uh, my opinion head coach of the year. Uh, because he is so willing to try things, and he gets buy-in from the players. They pull out a box and one. They, ha- I, they, what were they down? Thirty points or something like twenty-seven points to the Mavericks earlier this year oh, in the third quarter. Thing, yeah, came all the way back because they were doing a one-two-two full court press. <laughs> what? <laughs> the teams don't do that in the NBA, but they have a head coach who's willing to do it. They have players who buy in, and the players have the requisite skills, and now they have experience. Obviously, the thing that's going to hurt them is the ability to isolation score. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where Pascal is in that ability. He's a great uh, transition score. And Kyle Lowry is a very heady player. Um, and they, they have a number of players who could break it down, score, have a big man like Serge Ibaka, Marcus Sol is going to stand at three-point line, spread out the floor, and it's going to be very difficult to guard them. They'll be sound. But I don't know if they could score in the isolation in the half court, which I feel like, and maybe you guys can give your opinion on this, there's going to be a lot more of that with no fans in the crowd. I feel like there's going to be a lot of possessions that lose momentum Oof. and you end up in a little it's an interesting. You know, one-on-one isolation at the elbow. Yeah, I mean, and playoff basketball lends itself to that. I just, I, you know, we had a discussion last night with uh, Darius Soriano of Foreign Blue and Gold, just kind of talking through all this. Uh, there's so many little intangible things like that. Like, what does the lack of a crowd mean for Kyle Kuzma, who doesn't, you know, first playoff experience, doesn't have to have the hostile crowd, also doesn't get hyped up by the home crowd. Frank Vogel pointed that out. You know, there's LeBron not having to travel. There's little stuff like that. And God, I don't know. I, it's another one that I haven't thought of, though. Like, I feel like everything about this tournament is based in intangibles to some degree because... I never thought about it, so though. Like, the way, stuff. Yeah, the way, the way it, it actually affects... The plays themselves. That's a really interesting observation. Yeah, it's going to feel like uh, some of these games are going to feel like pickup runs uh, in the summer gym, but they're like for money or something like that. Well, it kind of is for money. <laughs> oh, they're, they're definitely <laughs> money. <laughs> we'll bet. They're de- we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for money, yeah, man. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know what you I know, love no. though about I love about the Raptors though is like you know they won a championship for the you know they're the Toronto Raptors. They won a championship like that wins you goodwill for a long time. You know, Masai Ujiri could have said, like, we're going to, we need to tear it down and rebuild it. Like, we can see where this is going. with, And they didn't. They're like, you know what? We owe it to our team. We owe it to our fans. And, by the way, the guys we have left over are pretty good. Like, this is, a, it, it's not like they, you know, you take Kawhi away from this team and and Danny and all of a sudden, like, they're a 35-win team. So, like, they, oh. they had confidence in what they could do. And they, they, they felt like almost like they owed the city a chance to let these guys go defend the title. Yeah, I remember being in Toronto when Kawhi, when the Kawhi news came out, and they were heartbroken uh, because, hold on, you just won a championship in this city that treated you like a king. If you come back next year, we're probably title favorites again. That's probably That was their mindset. Mm-hmm. And he turned it down to, to, to play for the Clippers, not the Lakers, the Clippers, uh, which is, you know, kind of took everybody by surprise. But I think it was imperative upon Masai Ujiri and Bobby Webster to make sure they remain competitive, not just to the fan base for this year, but he has a relationship with Giannis Atatakumbo. And put Giannis with OG Ananobi and Pascal Siakam, 
that <sighs> is the scariest front court. Young, have fun athletic. scoring on that. Exactly, and there's there's and with Toronto being the type of city that it is, diverse and, and being a melting pot, and Giannis being from Greece, and so and and having connections to the, the giants of Africa that Masai Ujiri is uh, very heavily involved in, it he has a legitimate chance to get Giannis in Toronto. Like I would not deny his ability, and I think. Bobby Webster and Masai Ujiri, I know Rob Palenka's down there, but there are not a lot of general managers mm -hmm. and front office personnel down in the bubble. The Raptors made sure that they're down there, and I'm sure that's going to help. I'm sure they thought about all the impact that can oh, have. Oh, the Bucks well, they needed Rob Palenka to rebound. You know, that's they all do. Like I, we saw, uh, uh, Maury was doing that. Like all these, like nobody's got any staff. But like if if the Bucks don't didn't bring one dude of the 37 down just to follow Giannis around. They were doing it wrong. <laughs> like the, it's yep. Tamperville down there, man. For sure. Uh, yeah, I, if I were if I were uh, the Bucks, I would be very cautious about what happens. I mean, I, it doesn't seem like Giannis is that type of guy, uh, but I don't think he. There is some offers out there that is going to be very hard to turn down if things don't go right. A lot of pressures on Chris Middleton. Point blank. Yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of pressures on Chris Middleton. And a lot of pressures on Eric Bledsoe because yes. he faded away heavy uh, in yeah. that series. And Chris Middleton, he was—he did not perform. He was not the second or third. He was not the third or fourth best player in that series, and he needed to be. Um, and that's part of the reason why they lost. Can we all agree that if there was like a, a five foot two, onto the Kumpo brother who was like a cello player? He'd still be signed by an NBA team. Like somebody <laughs> would sense. have him on their roster. Yes, makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Like makes like sense. Stan onto Tacumpo. Or, or <laughs> they they sign him if nothing else. Like they decide, you know, this is the year that we want an in arena cellist. Right. Like, you know, just... most 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 arenas they're you know they're playing the hip hop. You know, they're playing what's contemporary. <laughs> you know, what a lot of the players like. We're gonna go in a different direction. We're going cello. You know, in, the, in these big moments, you know, where it's tight or you know you just had the you know the fast break for the ages we're gonna bust out a little cello and it just happens that's what, to the, be that's what the people want that's what the kids want these days and it just happens to be the fourth onto the kumpo like there you aren't any might... others that the lakers could go sign right <laughs> like just for for good measure i think there's a high school i could be wrong but i think there's one in high school get him <laughs> if you don't mind i do want to jump in though i know we just talked about the raptors I do think the Sixers are very scary too. I'm though. glad. Okay, good. And Go the, ahead. And the Heat. I just, for whatever, because of Ben Simmons, Al Horford, Joel Embiid, and then if you look at the Heat, if you look at Bam Adebayo and a little bit Jimmy Butler, those are players that are uniquely qualified to guard Giannis. And you saw what happened mm -hmm. last year. Once Kawhi was put on Giannis, the Bucks didn't have another way to offer, operate their offense. And, Mike Budenholzer's criticism has been that he kind of sticks to what he wants to do and there isn't really too much variation. Well, it works so well, but these teams, I'm sorry, Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, and Al Horford, I would trust them to guard Giannis. Oh, yeah, if, if they the get it, especially if that series. Simmons at the four thing like clicks a little bit. Like Everybody's been waiting for like that. That's a tough team to, to beat. If, if Embiid's locked in and Simmons can actually – Hit a shot, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah, Giannis is not bullying them. He's not. No. He's going to have to hit some mid range. He's going to have to hit some threes. And until he does it, you can't ben, say that's going to happen. You guys both answer this question. Ben Simmons with a jump shot is a top blank player. Top six. Yeah. I mean, he's in, he's in that range. I mean, because at, the, at that point, there's not much you can really attack with him. I mean, like, he, he doesn't even have to be like a sniper. No, he just needs to, he just needs to just be respectable. Right. He needs to be somebody that if if he puts up that shot, you care. Because, like, you know, when, once you reach a certain stature in your career and, and people know you'll take that shot, they'll always guard you. Like, you know, Kobe, over the course of his career, you know, he'd go on crazy rolls from behind the arc. You know, he, he, he was at one point the, I think, try holder of the most threes in a game with 12. And I think it was, like, him, Steph, and – Someone random, like someone really, really random. But, you know, Kobe, for the percentages, 
was never a great three point shooter, but you're never going to leave Kobe open. Like you, you can't Just out of habit. do it. Right. And, and you know that he'll take that shot. And like most great, you know, truth be told, like Joel Embiid, you want him taking that shot. Like you actually, I think the Sixers are worse off for when he hangs out at the arc, but you're still going to pay attention to him there. Mm-hmm. I mean, because he's Joel Embiid. So if Simmons will just take that shot, you know, if he'll put it up with some, you know, some reliability, I don't know what you go at him for. Yeah, that that would be a very, a very scary proposition if Ben Simmons shoots the ball because he's already, uh, he's so quick in the fast. In the, yeah, elite in the playmaker, fast break. elite defender. He's a great defender. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, and he's strong. I think he would be a. a yeah, he would have to be an MVP and, candidate, top six player. And you're right; people don't talk shoot. enough about Miami. Like, you know, I don't think they. Can, I don't think they'll get out. But like, I, I, I sure as hell wouldn't want to play them. I mean, they, they remind yeah. me of sort of like the Eastern Conference ver- version of OKC. Like, I don't think anybody in the West really wants to play OKC. That doesn't sound fun. Yeah, Bam Adebayo is. is, is yeah. he's, he's a great physical specimen. Um, and he, he looks like somebody who can guard Giannis, another person that could force Giannis to potentially resort to jumpers. Speaking and of, if he of has great to, physical specimens, does. look at that. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I, I was correct. There is an Alexis Antetokounmpo, and he currently plays in Spain. Get him. Huh. So there you have it. Uh, he was born in 2001, so he is 18 years old. Oh, oh gotcha. that's old enough. God, yes, he'll be enough. turning 19 in August. All right, go sign that you know one. I don't care if he you can know dribble. What's you know what's surprising? I saw, I, when I was in Ohio, I used to cover Costas Atatakumbo because he played at Dayton. Yes. And I was like, like this is, is this really Giannis's younger <laughs> brother at Dayton? He couldn't finesse this into Kentucky? <laughs> <laughs> How did this end up in Dayton? Shout out to UD Arena and Dayton. This is a great college basketball city. But Go uh, Flyers. I was still surprised that he ended up there. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, it is uh, – hold on. I got, I, well, I, I, really, really quick before we sure. go, and this is the most inside basketball question we can possibly ask, but you may be unique, uniquely qualified to answer it. Okay. Danny, like we said a few times about this show, we like him a lot. He's a really smart, interesting guy to interview. He's really great with media. He's accommodating. He gives thoughtful answers. He also is very oh, easy. Oh, thank to you, Andy. Un- I forgot about that. He's that. very easy to understand. Like he doesn't mumble. He doesn't do anything like that. For some reason, that guy is the biggest mother bleeper to transcribe. He I, he is impossible. To transcribe, like all of us, you know, all of us who cover the team, like we all we all have shared uh, word documents mm-hmm. for all these different players that you know we keep running throughout the whole season, and we trade off transcriptions, right. and we, we all the work on room, it together. I'll do five minutes of AD so that everybody can have everybody can get it done or whatever. Right. We all like Rochambeau to not do Danny. Like really? you no, know, like Danny yeah, it's is, always Danny like all right, man, short no, 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 he is yeah, short Danny's straw. a short. No, no, no. You haven't done Danny Green at least a week. <laughs> this is your turn. From your time as somebody who's around him all the time, yeah. Why do you think he'd why be so this, hard to train? Nobody can figure impossible. it out. Possible. Wow. You know, I I wish I had an answer. Hmm. Okay. Okay. What is so difficult to? Is it just? He can't. He's not enunciating properly. No, he's, he's no. Fine. When he's talking, I understand him perfectly clearly. <laughs> I. It might be that he's a little bit stream of consciousness. So, like the sentences oh, don't yeah. totally a little bit. end. But Jared okay, Dud- yeah. Jared Dudley is almost like the micro machines guy. Sometimes, like he packs more <laughs> yeah. sentences he, and different things. Yeah, he's a like one second. Like, I mean, like there is no punctuation to a Jared Dudley sentence, and he's easier than than Danny. There's something with Dan, like maybe it's his, his cadence? cadence. I don't know. Yes, maybe I can see it being the cadence. I can see it being the cadence a little bit, but that's interesting. Okay, I, I, didn't know I that. want you to do I'm this. I'm not in the transcribing business. So <laughs> okay, well, I was going to say you're you, but you used to be because you're a journalist. Yes. You did yes. all that. Then the next time you do something with Danny, whether it's inside the green room, whatever, I want you to record it. 
Try to transcribe it and let us know if you notice this. Okay. Because yeah. I'm telling you, it's like it's, all of us are like. It's damn near impossible. Bad, it takes 20 minutes longer than it should. It's very wow. frustrating. This yeah. is illuminating. Uh, yeah, okay. now you know. And, uh, the yeah, good great dude, we like him. <laughs> yeah. Asking yeah, that question too. too our <laughs> asking that question too gave me enough yeah. time to download this, uh, the new art for Inside the Green Room uh, podcast with Danny Green and Harrison Sanford. Um, it, you can find on, you know, they post it on YouTube. You see it on Spectrum Sportsnet. It's wherever you get your podcasts. Um, it's important that, by the way, we have we have Harrison, a friend, two friends named Harrison, Harrison, it's Harrison uh, Fagan right there. Yep. Shout out then, to yeah. Mr. Fagan. <laughs> yeah. And so we have you. Um, but anyway, he was a really good sport about us posting all those giraffe photos when we had him on. Um, He's a good man. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great show. Uh, you guys do a great job with all the guests, um, and you constantly have a stream of really interesting people coming through. Uh, absolutely worth a listen, and we'll all keep an eye out for the new episode with Javale. Thanks so much for coming on, man. We really appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you for having me, and I hope uh, Lakers fans uh, can enjoy all of the opportunities that their players are, are giving them to get to know them better, whether it's the vlog that Javel does, uh, whether it's the podcast that Danny and I do, and there is a new podcast on the way from another Laker, and that should be coming soon as well. Oh, intrigue. Mm. I like that. All right, man. Thank you very much, man. We appreciate the time. This was fun, no man. Thank you. All right, no tomorrow night we'll be covering Lakers basketball. We're going to Bill Orm on and maybe a couple other people. We're just going to parade people through. Basketball's back tomorrow officially. Uh, excited about that. VSLicker.com. See everybody tomorrow.